Well, many of you know that Jay Leno does this segment on a show frequently called Jaywalking. In it, he stops people on the street and just asks them questions, normally around a particular theme, maybe something that time of year, or something about American history. And uh, I've mentioned this before, but if you are ever out in the Los Angeles area, and you see Jay Leno, and he's out on the street, and he says, can I ask you some questions? Run. Don't walk, run. Because let me tell you this, if you get every single question correct and look like a Rhodes Scholar, guess what they're going to do with your video tape? Toss it. You're not what they want. The only way you're going to make it on television is if you look like an imbecile. So if your goal in life is to have your friends mock you for the next 10 years, go ahead. But it's just amazing sometimes how ignorant people can be. And just some of the responses, like some of the people on this uh, video that we're going to watch right now. What were Jesus' parents' names? Uh, Mary and Joseph. Very good. Yes, very good. Very good. Very good. And approximately how many years ago did he live? Oh, gosh. 250 million years ago. <laughs> how many wise men were there? Um, 12. <laughs> and what did they bring Jesus' gifts? They brought him some wine. Who found the burning bush? Uh, Nixon. <laughs> what happened in the fight between David and Goliath? The story. We got in a fight with rocks. Who won? Goliath. <laughs> Who was swallowed by the whale? Okay, now I'm on the spot. Um. Joe. DiMaggio? Cain and... Abel? That's right. Who were they? Uh, Sitcom? The Old Testament was originally written in what language? Um, isn't it Old English? Old English. <laughs> How many apostles were there? Um, 40. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus sat with his apostles to eat and drink. <laughs> the trap was enormous. Adrian finished his lines in the Bible, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's car. Well, it's true you should not covet your neighbor's car. However, he might not be aware that several thousand years ago there were no cars. I love, too, the lady with uh, the whale and Joe, Joe DiMaggio. So no God does not have it in for baseball players from the 50s. Well, the fact, though, is a lot of people are ignorant of the Bible. They really don't know anything about it. And yet, it's what we say is the center of our faith. It's uh, what's so important to us. Studies show that the vast majority of American homes have a Bible in them. And yet people don't know about what it has to say to them. Now, when I talk about the Bible, let me clarify what I mean. There's a lot of books that call themselves the Bible. There's the Beauty Bible, the Golfer's Bible, even the Cooking Bible, which I read religiously. <laughs> Actually, not now. But these books are not what I'm talking about. So let's get back to basics. What is the Bible? Well, the word Bible means a book or collection of books regarded as authoritative on a topic. So in other words, the Fisherman's Bible is saying, this is the book that you need because we're going to tell you everything that is important. I heard of a local newspaper who said this, if religion is your sports, then our newspaper is your Bible. In other words, we are so into sports that we're all that you need. Well, no other book is more authoritative on our faith than the Christian Bible. Now, our Bible is a collection of 66 different books divided into two sections, Old and New Testament, written by over 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years in three different languages, Yet it presents a unified picture of God's plan and His purpose for humanity. Now, 39 of the books make up our Old Testament, which was written around 1500 B.C. to 400 B.C., starting with the book of Genesis, and it ends with the book of Malachi. The Christian Old Testament and the Jewish Bible actually contain the same 39 books. They're just in a different order. Now, the Roman Catholic Church includes something in the middle called the Apocrypha. If you grew up Catholic, then your Bible was bigger than our Bible. Now, the Apocrypha was originally not considered scripture. Matter of fact, the first 1,500 years of the church, uh, it was not considered to be scripture. It was about 500 years ago at the Council of Trent that the Pope and bishops decided to include it 
But until that time, it was considered devotional material, and we did not include it as an authoritative scripture. Now, the 27 books that make up the New Testament were written over a 50-year span, and they deal with the birth of Jesus, his life, his death, what happened in the early church, and then also gives directions on how to live our lives. Now, the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew, the little Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. Yet these diverse authors, each in their own way, give us a picture of the same God and his work for us. Now, the Bible was the first book ever printed. Matter of fact, it's the best-selling book of all time. There's, it's been translated into over 2,000 languages. So when I say Bible, this is what I'm talking about. This, these 66 books that make up the Christian Bible. Now, some opponents of our faith suggest the Bible we have can't be trusted because we don't have the original manuscripts. We don't have the original words. So they wonder how much have things changed. Well, currently, we found over 5,686 manuscripts in the New Testament, with the earliest ones dating to 125 A.D., or about 25 years after the New Testament was completely written. No one doubts the accuracy of Caesar's Gaelic Wars, which were written in 50 B.C., and they talked about Caesar's military campaigns. Now, there are only 8 to 10 good copies of Caesar's Wars, and of these, the earliest dates to 900 A.D., a thousand years after he wrote them. Aristotle's writings are taken as accurate, but there is over a 1,400-year gap between when he wrote and the first copy that we have. So in other words, when someone says, well, Aristotle said this, you go like, whoa, wait up. It's been 1,400 years between the first, when he lived, and the first copy. How do we know what Aristotle said? The fact is, we can trust the Bible because we have more historical documents on it than anything of its time. We can also trust that God watched over his word. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. God wanted us to know what he had to say. He protected his word so that we could have it today. God had protected its integrity because he wants you to know the truth. The Bible is God's word for our world. Now, as modern Americans, we're Bible rich. We have over 30 different translations. One survey, I, survey that I said saw that uh, I think it's like over a quarter of Americans have at least five Bibles of their own. I know as a pastor, I mean, I have stacks of them. I have so many different versions and, and different ones. And yet the fact is, so many people have it, and yet they don't read it, and they don't believe it. So today we're going to look at some key concepts of the Bible. Starting in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. A very famous passage. It says this, All Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now here we're introduced to another word that describes the Bible, which is scripture. The word scripture means sacred writings. Islam's sacred writing is the Quran. Hindus have the Bhagavad Gita. Mormons have the Book of Mormon. Well, the Bible is our sacred writings, our scripture. The Apostle Paul says these writings are breathed out by God. The fundamental characteristic of Scripture, of these writings, is that they are alive. That God spoke through them to us. That they're His word to His people. The Bible is God's writing, but breathed out through human authors. 2, 3, 2 Timothy 3.16 here tells us that it was, it's useful. This could also be translated as practical or relevant. See, some people think the Bible is just kind of like, ah, what's, what good is the Bible? It's relevant. It is useful. It is practical. Well, in what ways is it relevant? Well, it talks about four areas. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, teaching focuses on the Bible as giving words of instruction to live life. Now, this assumes that we will come to the Bible as learners. That we will want to hear what it has to say. I mean, everyone knows kids in school, not everyone's there to learn, right? How many of you are teachers? Teach in school. We've got a bunch of you. Do all your kids come in just saying, please, I'm a vessel. Please, unload on me. Let me learn. No, half of them are sitting there going like, please, Lord, let this stupid class end, right? Well, what God is looking for is people who want to be taught, who want to learn what he has to say. The most amazing teacher can do nothing. If the student doesn't want to learn. And so we have to be open to what God has to say, to his instructions. Now the great thing about the Bible, it doesn't just talk about salvation, which it does talk about. It doesn't just talk about prayer, which is wonderful. It talks about things like how to be a good spouse, how to be a good parent, 
how to have good relationships, how to take care of your money. It has a lot of practical advice. So it teaches us. It, also, it says here then rebuking. Now, this sounds kind of harsh. I mean, rebuking is not a word we like. But it really means confronting our wrong ideas about life. See, this assumes that all of us have misconceptions. All of us have areas of life in, in which the way we think is not the way it really is. And they need to be changed. For instance, if I measure your success by how much money you make, the Bible challenges that. When it talks about the fact that God measures success by our faithfulness to Him and by obeying Him. And so I've been rebuked by his word. I need to change because it has told me that what I think is wrong. It also says correction here. Correction is similar to rebuking, but it focuses more on behavior instead of beliefs. So this assumes that there are things in life that each of us does that need to be corrected. We have children. There's not a parent here who's got the most amazing kid. There's times we must correct them. So you may be a wonderful person, and overall you do most things right, but I promise there are things you do wrong. And so you need God's word to correct you, to show you what is right. And then it says also it's good for training in righteousness, which focuses on the Bible's role in helping us live a life that will please God. This assumes a life of integrity doesn't come naturally, and that we need help in doing this. See, the Bible trains us to do that which we could not do on our own, to live a life that would be pleasing to God. And all of this together results in us being spiritually equipped to live a life that is vital for God. The Bible provides us with the equipment that we need. You know, people say if all you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. Well, in life, not every problem needs a hammer. And so God gives us the complete toolbox. He gives us all that we need to live the life that He wants us to live. It provides us with the spiritual toolbox. You know, D.L. Moody once said this. He said, the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. That's such an important thing. The Bible is not given to increase our knowledge. God's goal is not when you get into heaven, there's not going to be a thousand question text. You know, and boy, if, I'm telling you, these people would fail if we watched with Jay Leno. But the God's not going to see how many scripts, well, you didn't know John 3, 16? All right, let's just, that's not what it's going to be about. It's not about what's just in here, it's about what's in here. Now the fact is, John 3, 16 is an important verse to know. Why? Because when you see it held up at football games, you don't want to be going, what is John 3.16? Now you know, for God's love the world. But the thing here, friends, is this. God wants the change to happen inside our hearts, to change our lives. When you read the Bible, your question should be, Lord, what are you saying to me? You know, when I'm working on a sermon, my goal is not that you will walk up to me afterwards and say, wow, Mark, that was really interesting. I'd never heard that before. You know what, as far as I'm concerned, that means I probably failed. My goal is, my prayer is that after the sermon you're saying, boy, i got to change that. Or man, there's this way I've been thinking about things and that's not right. The goal is not for you to know a lot. It's for your life to be transformed. Well, in the, in the book of Modern Times, Paul Johnson notes that the Russian leader Joseph Stalin was short, about five feet, four inches tall. Furthermore, he had a childhood accident, so his arm was a little misshapen and his hand was a little deformed. So when the dictator commissioned his portrait, he instructed the artist to paint him from his best angle, which was from below. If you've seen the typical picture of Stalin was painted from below, and he's there above you with his arms folded. Great way to look powerful, right? Football players, often if you see them for pictures, fold your arms, put your head back, it makes your neck look like twice as big. So Stalin knows these things, so his picture is taken making him look big and impressive and imposing. The reality was he wasn't those things. But his name that he chose for himself meant Man of Steel. Well, the fact is it's human nature to put ourselves in the best possible light. I remember reading about one of the great American generals who would only allow himself to be photographed from a certain side because that was his better side. The great thing with me is I don't really have a good side, so it doesn't matter. You know, video camera, go ahead. It's going to look bad either way. You know, just go ahead and do your worst. But the fact is God's word is a mirror for all of us. Stalin was not big and impressive. And the fact is some of us view ourselves in a certain way, and yet God's word shows us, no, here's what you're really like. Here's who you really and truly are. It's relevant for our lives. <coughs> the Bible is also our standard. In John chapter 17, verse 17, we find Jesus' prayer before his arrest. 
He, asks, he says to God, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. That's his prayer, sanctify them. Now, sanctify means to be made holy, to be made righteous, to be made pure. So he's asking God, Lord, please make them holy by your word. Your word is truth. Now, what is truth? Well, truth is whatever corresponds to the facts, something that matches the way something really is. So a truth statement is one that corresponds with reality. A key characteristic of the Bible is its truthfulness. Now, we live in a postmodern culture where people say, well, you know what, your truth is different than my truth. Well, the fact is, Jesus said he was king of kings and lord of lords. He, he said to himself he was the son of God. Either he was or he wasn't. He, either I'm right, he was the son of God, that's who he said he was, or he wasn't the son of God, which means I'm wrong. It doesn't just mean, well, we have differing opinions. No. And the fact is, the Bible is clear that it is the standard for truth. Really, it comes back to the Bible being God-breathed. It's, if the origin is God, then it's something we can trust. By saying the Bible is truthful, we're saying that it tells us things the way they are, that it accurately describes reality. Now, not all churches would agree with that. There are some churches out there that kind of say, well, some of Scripture is true, some of it isn't, and you've got to kind of sort it out. Well, you know what that makes the authority? You. You get to decide what God said and what God didn't say. I remember reading something once, The Light Church. I think I've shown it here before, but it was a picture of a church, and their sign out front said, The Light Church. And they talked about, they had like four commandments. You know, everything, and it says at the end, The Light Church, everything you wanted in a church and less. And the point was, man, we don't want all those commandments. Wouldn't you like to choose which commandments, you know? Kids, honor your father and mother. Scratch that one. You know, nope, I don't like that one. Don't covet. What? We're Americans. We're, we're taught to covet and what one of the people have. Well, the fact is the Bible teaches us what's right and what's wrong. Now, there are a lot of things that are true in life that the Bible does not contain. The Bible does not give a cure for measles. It does not teach you calculus. Thank the Lord for that. It doesn't teach you how to change a flat tire. There are other things in life that are true that we learn from. So there's other sources of truth in this world. The Christian college I attended, one of the mottos at Taylor University was, all truth is God's truth. In other words, whether you're a Bible major or a biology major, a Christian education major, or if you're studying calculus, if it's true, then God was the one who created that because he is a God of truth. So the fact is there's things in science and history that the Bible doesn't include that are true. But where the Bible does speak to these areas, it is trustworthy. We have to remember it wasn't written as a historical book so that we could go like, oh, wow, that's history. It was written to change our lives. But what it does say is true. And so it's our ultimate standard. Just like a ruler is a standard. You want to know how long a foot is? Get your ruler and you can see. In the same way, the Bible is our standard. But some of the biggest problems we have today in our culture is that we're biblically ignorant. We don't know our Bible. People don't know what it has to say. How can you live out what God wants when you have no idea what he wants you to do? I mean, people know football players' names. I mean, some of the guys here, you can quote me stats left and right. You've got your fantasy football team. You know everything there is to know about those players. Others of you love musicians, and you know everything about their life. Your favorite TV show, you can give me the backstories on characters. And yet so many of us are ignorant about what our Bible says. You know, Jay Leno at another time asked this question on the street. He said to two ladies, he says, can you name one of the Ten Commandments? One of these college-age women responded, freedom of speech? <laughs> no, that would not be one. He also asked the friend then, complete this sentence, let he who was without sin, see if you guys know, <laughs> cast the first stone, her response was, have a good time? <laughs> no, that kind of wasn't the thought either. He then turned to a young man and asked, who, according to the Bible, was eaten by a whale? This guy knew the answer. Any, anyone want to guess who he thought? Pinocchio. That is exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> who, according to the Bible, was eaten by a whale? Yes, Pinocchio. <laughs> you know, that must be the apocryphal, because my Bible doesn't have that one. I, I don't know. No, that's the Disney Bible. <laughs> well, the Bible is truth. But the only way we can know the truth of the Bible is by spending time in God's Word. We have to read it and get to know it. It's not enough to own a Bible. Well, that's great. You need to read your Bible. 
By the way, I want to say we always have Bibles on our back table, and those are there, and they are free. And if you need a Bible, take one. If you have a friend who needs a Bible, take it for them. But that's why they're there. We want you to read God's Word. So the Bible changes. It's our guidebook. It's what we use in life to know who we're to become. It changes us as Hebrew 4.12 tells us. It says this, For the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So along with Scripture here, we're introduced to a description of it as the Word of God, or God's Word. Even though these words are printed on paper with ink, they're living, they're active, they're God's Word for us today. This means there's a dynamic energy when we read the Bible. When we read and study it, really seeking to find out what God has to say, His Spirit speaks into our life. Now again, it depends on how you read it. I mean, I remember at seminary, almost every class you had to read 1,500 pages for each class. And some of those theology books are boring. And I mean, when I say boring, like, they just want to shoot me, please. And so, you know, some guys would say that they use the fan. You know, they turn their fan on and just, you know, the pages change with the fan. Now, I did not do that, but I am a very fast reader. I really, I can whip through things. But the problem is I reach a certain speed of reading in which I'm not really retaining any of it. And you can do that with your Bible. You know, well, I need to read a chapter. I should. And whoop, whoop right through it. Well, what'd you read? Um, yeah. It's like when you ask your kids, you know, how'd your test go? Oh, my God, let me. The sad thing is, so often when we're reading, we're not really seeking to find out what God has for us. So that always when you read God's word, it needs to be, Lord, what do you have for me today to learn from this? Because the Bible wants to change us. It says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It divides. It cuts deep into us. So often we're reading the word, you just go, wow, Lord, okay. Yeah, that's, that's me. I, I need to change that. The Bible, as a double-edged sword, focuses on its ability to penetrate into our lives. It's sharp. And just as a caterpillar is transformed into a butterfly, so God wants our lives to be transformed. See, the Christian faith is not just merely a set of ideas. Being a Christian is not about being able to, to, to spout off doctrines or reciting creeds. You probably know people. Maybe you grew up with them. Maybe you know them now. They can recite the creed or whatever their religion is. They can talk about doctrines of the Bible, even if they're a Christian, and yet there's no love. There's no warmth. It hasn't penetrated into their heart, which is where God wants it to work. See, being a Christian isn't merely accepting certain facts about God or the Bible, but it's becoming a follower of Jesus. It's seeking to live passionately for Him. The Christian faith is about being transformed, not merely being informed. So once we enter, enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible, then, is God's primary way to speak to us. Now, he's not limited to the Bible. God uses the Holy Spirit sometimes just during a time of prayer. He speaks into your life. Sometimes it's through another words of a friend or another Christian you know. Sometimes it's through suffering that God speaks to us. But the Bible is his central means. If you want to know what he has to say? Here's where you go. If you don't want to be transformed, don't read your Bible. That'd be my suggestion. Now, I would say this. Most of us, if, if I read a book, I've never understood people who start at the end of the book and like find out what happens at the end and then go and read it. What's the point of that? If you're ever with me, I've mentioned this before, if you're with me, though, at the theater, and when they do the previews, as a matter of fact, I will normally go out and get a drink of water during the previews. Because nowadays, they're like 23 minutes long. I'm not kidding. Like 23 minutes of previews. The thing is, they give you five minutes about a movie. And so you know at the beginning, this guy and this woman, they hate each other. And then you know by the middle, they're laughing together. By the end, they love each other. Well, why do I need to see the movie? I now know what happens. Or you know that this guy is being shot at by these people, and he's going to die. But no, wait, he's in the next scene. So I don't, don't want to know what's going to happen. And the fact is, when we read the Bible, you don't start at the end. But also, I would say this, don't start at the beginning because it's not a novel. I would encourage you to start with your New Testament. If, you're not, if you've not read your Bible, go about three-quarters of the way through to the book of John. John gives the life of Jesus, who he was, what he did. Follow into the book of Acts. It gives the early church. The book of Romans, Paul gives some amazing, powerful words. But read it, because God wants it to make a difference in your life. So many of us have multiple copies of the Bible around our, our house, but they're never opened. They're never used. 
You know what? There are Christians throughout the world who envy us. Maybe they're in Islamic countries where they're repressed. Maybe they're in a communist country and they're not allowed to read their Bibles. They're not allowed to have Bibles. And they couldn't imagine that. What? You guys all have Bibles and you don't read them? You know, back 500 years ago, before the printing press, a church would maybe have one Bible. Guess who got it? The minister. So you would have to wait all week long just hoping that this week Pastor Mark actually has a good message. <laughs> Knowing the odds are slim, but maybe it'll be an off week. But the fact is, back then they couldn't read the Bible for themselves. God has placed this in our hands. And he wants us to read it. Can you imagine back when you were dating, for those of you, if, maybe if you are dating someone, you can picture yourself now. For those of us who have been a while, remember what that was like. But imagine if you've gone far away and you're not going to see the person you love for the next year. And you get a letter in the mail, we'll go back to the older times, there's no email, there's no texting, there's no phoning them, and you get a letter from them. Now what would you do with that letter? Would you go, you know what, I know they love me. I know what they're going to say, I'm going to work, blah, 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 mom and dad are doing this, blah, blah, blah. I, I pretty much know what they're going to say, I love you, you're wonderful, you're the best, I miss you, blah, blah, blah. And would you toss that letter? <coughs> no way. You, you, you might even have an idea what they're going to say. You want to read it because you want to hear from them. Friends, God sent you a letter. He wants you to know what he thinks. The question is, are you going to read it? I want to tell you this. Coming to church is a great start. We study the Bible here during the sermons. Sunday school, Glenn Petrusky has his doctrine in apologetics. This guy knows the word. He's teaching a class right now on the basics of the Christian faith and then what the cults believe and the differences. So his class, 930, right there in that classroom. My wife teaches a Sunday school class on Esther. They're meeting back there for ladies. Glenn's group is men and women. Devs is ladies only. But I would encourage you, go to that. We're going to be starting up care groups. On the 29th, we're going to start the series, Not a Fan. I will preach on the 29th. That day and for the next week, new care groups will be starting. We've got a lot of new ones. I would invite you and encourage you. Fill out that yellow form you can saw in your bulletin. Go ahead and do it today. That would be really nice. Don't wait till the last minute. Don't do what we normally do. If you could turn that in, that'd be helpful. Care groups are a great place to study God's Word together. Because as you read it and discuss it, it has a deeper impact. But more than that, the question is, will you have your own quiet time with God? That's where it really happens. A time where it's just you and Him. It doesn't need to be an hour. It may just be ten minutes. But spend time reading His Word. You know, Martin Luther once said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. If you're looking for spiritual truth, you don't need to look any further. Open it daily. Read it faithfully. And live it out. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Like a mirror, it shows us who we really are. Father, we're so good at deceiving ourselves. I'm thankful that your word reminds us of who we really are and how much we really do need you. Father, I would pray for us. Lord, help us to take seriously the reading of the Bible. Father, I pray we wouldn't just read it and set it down, but that we would meditate on it, that we would think about it that we would allow it to speak into our lives. Father, I pray for each person here today that your word would be central to their life and that they would allow you to speak to them. Father, for those who are here today and they're not sure that they can trust the Bible, they're not even sure about you, Lord, I ask that you would be revealing yourself to them, your love, your goodness, and the fact that they can trust you. And Lord God, I'd ask all this in your name.